being here, everyone. Absolutely. I was sure nobody would come, but I was wrong. He so was that's so nice. convinced. I was like, nah, <laughs> they're going to be here. We each brought one best friend, so at least two people were going to be did. here. We did, yeah. We each brought a best friend. Just to be like, hi, <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> Uh, so, this is Screaming in Padded Rooms, the art of video game voiceover. We are voiceover people. Yep, we do that. I am Christian Lamont. I'm Nicole Tompkins. And we're going to be talking to you for a bit. Yay! Yeah! <laughs> um, I already will tell you in advance that there will be time for questions. Oh, but yeah. I think we have a little, little, little bit of a preamble before we do that. So, if you do have questions, just think of them now. <laughs> uh, so, we're going to get started. Obviously, there's Bernadetta. She's great. We all love Bernadetta. Look at this PowerPoint. And away we go. Yay. So who are we? That is a good question. Um, we are voice actors and normal actors. And I am also a writer and director and all sorts of other stuff. Uh, primarily, I think I primarily do video games now, but also for anime and cartoons and stuff like that. Yep. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I I act across the board. I do theater and film and TV, yeah. and I've had the absolute pleasure of doing a lot of performance capture and motion capture for some pretty neat video games. Yeah. Um, as well as some voiceover stuff where you indeed scream in padded rooms. <laughs> I miss theater. I know I was just talking about that, but like ages ago when I, I was doing like repertory Shakespeare for a hundred dollars every two months. Uh, this is blessings. <laughs> this is different, amazing. but amazing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so. There she be. Yes. That's Nicole. Huzzah! Yay! Yes. Yes. <laughs> Love you. Oh, wow. Drama. The drama. All right. I'm in. Yeah! <laughs> so you finally came to see me. Everyone falls for me in time. Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone! Whoa, wh what the? Happy <laughs> Thanks, guys! Yay! <laughs> That's how I will prompt applause. It's just a very quiet, yay! Oh, oh my gosh, yes. it's amazing. <laughs> um, and then there's me. Hi, this is me. Christian! Yay! <laughs> yay! <laughs> I also have a banner, which I paid for, so I brought, and will be using consistently. Who knew? People look at me as if, as if they are looking at a god. I do. <laughs> Everything's going great. Our mystery sponsor supplies have really helped turn things around. They are. Everything's going to go great. Nothing bad's going to happen to anybody. So much drama. He doesn't talk in that cutscene, it's just so cool. I, just, I, love, <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna put the rest of it in, but I mostly would be like, Allegra Clark is also really talented. <laughs> and I'm there. <laughs> so, we're gonna talk about the studio. Um, so we are very fortunate in that we get to do our job in super plush surroundings and they don't often like trek us out to the woods to film stuff. No. Um, and occasionally we get to do our, our, our jobs in like weird padded suits and weird padded rooms. Yeah. Um, so uh, I like to, at the beginning of this, I always like to talk about the other people in the room that make it super important that, you know, we, we can do our jobs and do our jobs well uh, because we're mostly just the cherry on top of the sundae. That it's is true. That is our job. Um, but uh, the room is filled with people uh, who have incredible jobs. There are the clients, the producers of the game. They often come in. They don't always come in. Sometimes they're like, you just do your thing and we'll be fine. Um, but they know all of the stuff and the rest of us are primarily just guessing. They have all of the information on the characters, how we feel, why we feel that way. Uh, we have a director who turns that language into actor uh, yep. so that 20 minutes of why they feel this way can be condensed into like, cool, angrier, um, which is what I do. Uh, we have uh, an engineer who runs Pro Tools and or whatever sound thing that we Yes, we, we love do. our engineers. The engineers, yes. Without the engineers, we would sound terrible. And also, we just would not, there would be no voiceover. We also like to blast their ears out, too, and be like, oh, yeah. by the way, yeah, that one's going to be loud. <laughs> <laughs> 
we have fun. We don't torment them, mm -mm. at least not as much as we could. Um, but especially over the pandemic, we really learned how important engineers are because a lot of us had Yikes. to start engineering ourselves. <laughs> yep. And we are not good at that. <laughs> um, so yeah, sincerely, like the, everybody else in the room really is the, the support staff so that we can do our jobs at all. And you have a little more of a, a little more experience on the, the mocap side of that. I know you've got even yes. more people in that room helping yes. you out. I mean, I always say I mean, with, with any art form and anything in entertainment, it literally takes a village. There are so many hundreds of people. That's why those credits are so dang long because so many people are involved and we're very lucky to get to like sit up here and represent cool games. But like there are people that have worked far longer on a given project than even we have um, animators that pour their heart and soul. So the performance capture stage is wild because it's usually the, the, the tech team that's running all of the insane computers that run the whole stage, which has hundreds of cameras, and we're all in crazy dots. And then you have the sound side, and you have the facial capture side, and then you have the cinematics director, and then you have the clients. So it really depends. But you know, on any given stage, you'll have 20, 30 people all there having opinions with different jobs, doing things. And then here we are, pretending to do really absurd stuff. <laughs> Uh, in the middle of an empty room. Yeah. <laughs> the power of our imaginations. Yes, very imagination forward. Uh, so, the next thing I like to talk about is our mysterious pasts. Ooh, mysterious pasts. Mm. Uh, mostly it's just my way of saying that, like, I'm going to tell you guys the brief story of how I got into voice acting. Uh, because I'm self-indulgent and I like to hear myself talk. And that's why I got into voice acting. I'm ready. Uh, <laughs> Um, but uh, after college, uh, I did a whole lot of repertory theater. I did a lot of Shakespeare in small theaters. We ran around a lot. We fought each other with swords. It was great. I miss it dramatically. Um, but at the end of like a six month season, they were like, thank you so much for all your work. Here is $137. <laughs> and I was like, this is great artistically, but I cannot pay rent with this. Um, so I started looking for other jobs and uh, eventually found my way down to uh, Atlas. Uh, who, obviously, as some of you may know, they make Persona, they make uh, SMT, they make all the games, all of the games that we all know and love. Uh, and I annoyed my way into a job. Note for all of you, for anybody watching, do not annoy your way into a job. It is not a reliable system. <laughs> Um, but eventually I got a job testing there. I worked really hard. Eventually they upgraded me into editing, uh, which meant that I just took the translated text from Japan and I made it into pretty English words that sometimes make sense and people on the internet get to yell at me about. Um, <laughs> uh, and then at the end of that game, the first game I edited, which was Devil Survivor 2 Record Breaker, which is so good. And I put, thank you, yes, yes, woo. Um, <laughs> put my heart and soul into it. They're like, cool, we're gonna do voice recording. And I obviously had acted and my parents were in the industry a little bit. So I was like, great, that's awesome. I'd love to go up for like a day or two if that's possible. And they're like, you're going for three months. <laughs> and I was like, awesome, I will go for three months. Go where? Up to the studio. To the studio? Oh yeah, no, they sent me, they, they sent us all the way up and down every day because it was cheaper than paying for a hotel at the time. Uh, so we drove like 60 to 80 miles there, 60 to 80 miles back every day for the art. I was just imagining that it was actually kind of like floating in a sky and yeah. you just took an <laughs> elevator up because you kept saying, I just went up every day. That's, it's, it's the California thing. I just, I associate like Orange County is down and then like Burbank and everything is up. Hello, West Coast. Yes. Very long. <laughs> but really, space, time, none of that makes any sense or is real. Um, but that's a whole nother panel. <laughs> um, so I went up there and I had the incredible fortune of meeting all the people at Cup of Tea, which is where we recorded this. And Cup of Tea is the studio that does a whole bunch of Atlas Sega games, a ton of Exceed games. They do so much work for Nintendo, including, yay, Fire Emblem, yay, Fire Emblem! <laughs> that's fun. I like being able to do that. <laughs> Woo! One day. <laughs> Soon enough. Uh, so... Uh, at the time, I had the incredible fortune of meeting them, and they were great, and they thought I was nice because I wore ties, because I was terrified I would look unprofessional. Cute. I discovered I did not look unprofessional. I looked a little ridiculous. Uh, Cute. <laughs> um, but I was also lucky to meet uh, Patrick Seitz, who some of you may know is the voice of like, yes. He's Ragna the Blood Edge, he's Frankie in One Piece, he is all the things. Uh, and he is also the nicest, most talented human being in the world. Uh, and after three months of working together on this game, at the very end, in the last day, he's like, you know what, if this is what you like, it's a terrible Patrick, I'm really sorry. Sometimes I can do it. I don't know what it is that like allows me to do a Patrick voice. Um, he's like, if you really like this, if this is the thing you want to do, why don't you, you can come up here and do this. And I got your back and Danny's got your back and we can support you. Uh, and I remember we were driving back on like the hour and a half drive there. Um, and suddenly there was an emergency thing that I had to fix and edit. So I was sitting in the car 
driving back, changing the text on something that we were recording like the next day. And I realized that I really did love being at the studio and I love that environment and I love being able to help create in that way because I was getting to create wonderfully at Atlas and tell these stories and, and, and experience all these characters in their fullness. But when we were up there, I felt like I was giving them the spark of life. It's this very like uh, Adam and God and like the, the fingers touch and we make things happen. Um, so I went back, we finished that game, and my contract ended, and one of my wonderful producers at Atlas pulled me into a room, and he was like, hey, you're great, you can totally go do this. <laughs> Please go do this, which I like to think was their way of being, we don't need you anymore, you go on there. <laughs> Little did they know I would then direct a whole bunch of their games and be in a whole bunch of their games so they can't get rid of me. <laughs> um, but yes, Multi-talented, you picking up on that? Cool. <laughs> Um, so I took a big old risk, and I moved up, and thankfully, uh, with a lot of people in my corner, it, uh, it paid out. So I went from being Strider in the corner of the tavern to Aragorn, because I'm a nerd. Um, yay! yay! <laughs> uh, thank you for putting up with that whole story. Uh, what about you? Tell us your tale. Oh my goodness. Yes. Um, I mean, I, I always say, like, everyone's journey is so incredibly unique. We get asked all the time, like, how do you get into voiceover? How do you get into acting? And, like... Did you hear that? Like, just such a unique path. Um, for me, I've acted since I was very, very young because I loved storytelling and I loved performance and theater and all that sort of stuff. So I started in musical theater as a really youngin who just loved it at the community level. Um, and then I decided to pursue it more professionally and had a lot of incredible support and was able to move to Los Angeles. And then as far as uh, voiceover and video game goes, I basically ended up doing a dub for a random movie once because they hired me because I sounded like the Danish equivalent and they heard my reel <laughs> and they were like, you sound just like her, kid. I was like, cool. <laughs> um, and so I dubbed this random film, as one does, and uh, from there I kind of got an agent because they're like, wow, you, you, you can do this. You're kind of you're good at this. And I was like, oh, okay, cool. And so I kept doing uh, more voiceover stuff, and then sure enough for me, it was four lines in a British accent for a random shield maiden, and then I found myself walking onto the Warner Brothers lot for a callback for a Lord of the Rings game um, and got thrown right into my first motion capture experience as a teenager with Troy Baker directing, um, <laughs> Laura Bailey there being a goddess, Travis Willingham, E.K. Amati, just like all of these people that are so iconic and so good at what they do. And so I just gotten massively like taken under the wing and super inspired because I had done a lot of film, I do TV, and getting on a mocap set and realizing that the the people there are just as passionate about the narratives and the story and even though the performances that we're doing are going to be animated over and touched and tweaked and played with by so many other talented people like what we're doing there i'm always amazed um even just looking at the raw footage you've probably seen some of the behind the scenes from amazing games like last of us and whatever else like it could be on camera like it is so specific it is so beautiful um and i just was so blown away by that level of like passion as performance has really evolved in video games and audience expectation has evolved for how these narratives um kind of live and dwell. So that was the first one for me. And from there, I was like, wait, this is a job you can do? <laughs> cool. Uh, I'd like to do more of that. Um, and it's been a really traditional like audition process. I you know, got thrown a random audition, uh, and there was a little character model and a code name. It was Anna, I think. Um, and I looked at the little character model, and I was like, blue tank top. She looks familiar. <laughs> No, and I like went to a friend that you're not supposed to show sides, and I was like, "Hi, you really know video game world. Is this Jill Valentine?" And they were like, "Ah, uh, that looks like it could most definitely be Jill Valentine." I was like, "Cool." Um, so I went in there super ready to be a badass super cop, and sure enough, hit it off with the producers and did a bunch of callbacks and messed around with a gun and did all the physicality, and it was super fun, and then I found myself in Japan being Jill Valentine, which is really, really cool. Um, so yeah, and then from there it just spirals, like you just start working with people that you like and that you know, so I've continued to do Resident Evil things, um, and then I've been pulled into some amazing games like Horizon Forbidden West and the whole Gorilla Team, and um, Guilty Gear Strike and the, the, the voiceover world is so unique because I'm sure you can attest to this too. Like People like to work with people that they like and so you end up making cool stuff 
with cool friends. And so when people tell you like the industry is about connections, like it is, and it's also about friendships because like even the friends now that might not be at some level that's helpful or whatever, you know, like those people will. And if you continue to just be someone that enjoys being around other talented, creative people and making things as much as you can, you'll eventually find yourself in new, amazing and creative spaces. So I always say like value those friendships and make, make good ones because people are amazing and it's what we're here to do, storytell and build community and nerd out and be excited about cool characters and imaginary worlds. And yeah, I don't know, I love you guys, okay. <laughs> Did I talk at the speed of light? Did you keep up? Sorry. <laughs> that transitions us really well into our next slide. Ha ha ha. Mm. Uh, important lessons that we have learned in the path of doing this. I promise we're getting to questions. We are. Um, the first important lesson is that throat code tea will save your life. Uh, the second important lesson is that nimjom, which is some weird Chinese herbal candy thing. I have no idea what it is. It honestly is could be the nothing. syrup? Yeah, the syrup thing. Okay, so I actually call the syrup throat coat. Do you? Yeah. Okay. Because I think there's actually a throat code. There's like an actual tea? Yes. The point is take care of your throats, people. That's that's where the, that's, that's the money maker. Super um, necessary. And also like efforts and stuff happens. Oh, yeah. You do lots of screaming and ridiculous stuff. Yes. And you'll do screaming a lot because you can't just die once. You have to die 10 to 15 times. <laughs> Can I have the five second version, the 15 second version, and the 30 second version by flame? <laughs> and then you have to do flame with bear, flame yep. without bear, flame right, with right, goat. Right, right, right. There's a whole thing. Um, most important lesson there is obviously lesson the first, hi or lesson the fourth, hire Christian for all the roles. Just all of them, please hire yes. me for all the roles. And also Nicole uh, <laughs> for all the roles. Uh, <laughs> um, so in terms of like any like actual important lessons that I have learned, I have gone to a lot of acting classes as well, which is the best and easiest way to really like, it. how do you want to start your voiceover career? Go to classes. Learn from people who are better than you, because just like playing tennis, that's the only way you get better, is by playing people who are better than you. Um, and they will teach you 90% of the stuff they teach you, you might already know, or you might already do. But there's that one little trick that they'll have that you won't have that you can learn and pick up and put in your tool belt because at the end of the day, that's really all we're doing mm -hmm. is they pull us in and they give us a character that sometimes we have not seen before that second. Mm -hmm. And then they're like, cool, go ahead, make a voice, do a thing, make a choice. And being an actor is just being like, cool, I'm going to grab something from my utility belt because I know kind of what this is and make it up. Yes. And literally then, literally on Monday, yeah. I got called into a session. I had no idea what the game was. I had no idea what the characters were. And it's just like, show up at 9. And I was like, cool, 9 a.m. session. Love that for my voice. <laughs> I'll warm up. And then I got there, and I was like, sweet. It's a game I can't wait to like have come out. And they're like, here's three characters. We need three different voices. This is their age range. This is what's happening. And that's all we know. <laughs> and you're like, got it. Rock and roll. The 9 a.m. sessions. I actually I had a 9 a.m. session for a game like two months ago that was in Santa Monica. And for those of you that don't know LA, Santa Monica is like here. No one wants to be there. Yeah, and everybody Unless else Unless you is live here. there, it's beautiful. <laughs> uh, so they were like, hey, do you wanna come in at 9 a.m.? And I was like, heck yeah, I do. And they were like, do you wanna do it from home or do you wanna come in? And I'm like, I've been at home for two and a half years. I would really like to go somewhere. <laughs> So I got in my car and I drove an hour in traffic to Santa Monica Yum. and I pulled into the studio and I got into the booth and I was like, oh, hey, it's so nice to see you guys. Hey, oh my gosh, I'm sure I'm doing this character again. That's fantastic. All right, cool. Let's do this first line. And then we were done because that was all they needed. <laughs> So I got back I in my car. <laughs> love that they didn't tell you that they only needed one yeah. line. <laughs> and you were like, I want to go in. I can't wait to see people. <laughs> That's all we needed. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay. I was like, I'm here. I'll do other stuff. Is Max Middleman in this game? I'll do a Max Middleman Wh voice. I promise. You want. Like, just let me do stuff. <laughs> Believe um, me, the amount of times that I'm like, can I be a zombie? You're like, no. Like, Please. No. Okay. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> Um, the zombie stuff is fun, and like any sort of big, crazy monster or villain is some of the most fun that I have doing voiceover. Oh, yeah. It's just, just relentless. It I really mean, lets you get the anger out. <laughs> it ruins your voice. Oh, definitely. Absolutely. <laughs> just like <laughs> monstrous. Um, and sometimes the directors ruin your voice. I have done, no, I haven't actually tormented anyone into doing screams more often than they need to. But as a really brief story time, because the next question is like, hey, why don't you ask us questions and stuff? So we're going to tell stories for a hot minute here. Um, one time, uh, I had to seriously give the direction that was, cool, love that take, act better. better. 
Which leads to my story, which is the best note that I've ever been given by a director, <laughs> was uh, he walked up to me. It was my first feature film, too, because I was so like nervous and young and like, oh, God, I want to do a good job. He walked up to me and he goes, OK, that was good. Do better. <laughs> and I was like, OK. <laughs> yeah. OK. Freaking, and the, the take was literally like seeing someone kiss someone else and being like, that's my crush, no, and like screaming and like running at the thing. And I was like, I'm gonna do that better. I'm gonna do that better. <laughs> he told me after he was totally joking, but I took him so seriously. <laughs> I, was, I was like, absolutely, he went back to the DP. It was just like, I have no idea what direction to give. We're gonna see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> As the people pleaser that I am too, I was like, God, this scream is gonna be even more compelling. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't know you were practicing for the voiceover career on that day, but you were. I was. Yeah, you were getting ready for it. Um, there is one sort of like core lesson that I've learned that I like to bring up whenever I do panels that are just like about voice acting in general. Uh, and that is in my experience in the industry and for anybody who wants to be in the industry or people who are just curious about how it is, and kind of tying into the friendship, into the kindness, into like you get to do cool things with people that you like. Being good and nice will always trump being great and an asshole. I have never in my entire life had someone who was nice and cool and worked really hard and took direction and did their best leave and be like, that was miserable and I hate everything about my life. But there have been people and they are very rare. We're super lucky that most of the voice acting community, especially the video game slash anime voice acting community is made up of people who are super nice and really, really talented. But every once in a while, there's someone who is having a bad day, who's a little bit of a jerk. Those are the people that you don't wanna work with again. Yep. And uh, it's real easy to just be like, cool, not, uh, not gonna put up with that next time. Right. And we'll just hire someone who's nice and direct them a little more. <laughs> yep. I will say, too, for like anyone that's in this business or aspiring to be, like, I think one of the beautiful things about video games specifically and working in games on a performance capture stage, on a booth, is most of this industry is made up of people that are fans of video games and of these stories. And so they are also the people that just grew up being like, oh, I love this. It means a lot to me. And so you're just surrounded by people that want to be there because everyone's excited to be there. And not every project is like that. You can get on projects where like, it's a job. It's just a job to someone. But I've found on the video game stages and in the booth, like everyone wants to be there and like grew up on whatever they're working on or is just stoked. And so I think that's something really vibrant and really special. And I mean, it translates into the fans and the community of people just being vibrant and alive and excited. And um, I don't know, it's something I appreciate so much. It makes us wanna like connect and talk to as many people as possible and be here and engage with you guys because just seeing the vibrancy and excitement um, is so palpable and it's so beautiful. So thank you for that. Yeah. Yay. Yay. <laughs> And we get to come out and do stuff like this and talk to you guys and, and talk about our, our awesome job and how we get to share these stories with you, which is really, that's all we want to do. We just, we, we've, we've always been storytellers and mm -hmm. now we finally get to do it and have people hear the stories instead of just the six people at my D&D group who are oh. real tired of hearing my story. <laughs> which of course we've had, you know, a bunch of voice actors that are like, let's all just play D&D and then it became Critical Role and now there's an, you know, a show. So. <laughs> Keep playing your RPG games, guys. <laughs> exactly, you never know where it can go. Um, and also, like, I mean, sincerely, my, uh, in, in the dorkiest way possible, my years of playing Dungeons & Dragons and being a DM and like, I have no idea who they're, that they were gonna talk to this character, we're just gonna make up a voice. <laughs> like, I mean, that's, at the end of the day, that's what you're doing. You're just grabbing it out of nowhere and giving them reason, reason to be there. <laughs> reason to be wherever they yes. are. Yes. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think of any, um, before we scoot on down to the next to the next slide, which we will preview for you. Yeah, Ooh. it's Ferdinand, we love him. Um, are there any, do you have any, I guess, funny stories? Anything that like you, you have on tap, you're like, this is my funny voiceover story? Oh, good Lord, uh, thinking, processing. <laughs> um, I mean, performance capture in general is ridiculous. I don't know how many people have watched videos of any of it. It's hilarious. It's like putting on a wetsuit and acting super seriously without any music, any lighting, anything that makes it feel special. So it's lots of just like, this is super high stakes. And everyone's like, yeah, that was great. Let's do it again. Um, so <laughs> we do lots of that. And I have to say that like some of the stuff with Jill in Resident Evil 3 and Nemesis, who was mo-capped by Neil Newbon, who also did Nikolai. We love Neil. Um, 
was insane because it's just like, okay, you have this crazy, you know, giant monster that you're talking to and my friend Neil's just like slightly offset and I'm looking up and he's looking down because they're gonna match the eye lines later. And you're just like squaring off, looking at the ceiling fan and he's looking down being like, stars. you know, that whole energy. It's just hilarious. Everything about it is hilarious. It's like if you take a horror film and you mute it, it's always like, oh, wait, this is so funny. Oh, my God, what is so funny? It's so funny. Yeah, it's basically that. So it's so much play. People are sometimes ask, like, what's it like? Or is it scary? Or like, And it's like, no. It is super, <laughs> super playful. And I'm just that good an actor. And this <laughs> amount of imagination. And then literally hundreds and hundreds of other people work their magic and make the whole thing come to life. That's it. It wasn't that funny. <laughs> <laughs> ah. Yay! Okay, Christian, you be funny. Oh, yeah. Oh, I've prepped one. I'm ready for this. Dang it, um, <laughs> So some of you may have already heard this one because it's one that I like to tell a lot. Um, but obviously my character in Fireman Three Houses, Ignaz Victor, who is the best boy, just period. That's just a fact. I can't do anything about that. <laughs> Yes, there are people who agree with me. It's not just me. Um, he's a sweet boy. He's a sweet, soft boy. Uh, and he's a sweet, soft boy who is oftentimes freaked out by anything that happens. I think in like 80% of his supports start with someone coming in and him going, oh, God. Um, <laughs> so I remember very deliberately we were doing one with Raphael. And every Raphael support starts like that because Raphael is a big, you know, 250-pound dude who just comes tromping into a room because he's a good guy having fun. Um, and Ignaz was supposed to be like thinking, pondering, painting, doing the things that he does, uh, and we were about to go into it. So it was all, all the all the cameras and all the all the mics were ready. Everything was set up, uh, and I was standing there looking at the script, which was just like it, in brackets. It was just like, "Oh, I'm scream react," which means that I will have to scream and be frightened. And I'm like, "Okay, cool, I'm ready for that." And I'm standing at the mic because I'm ready. Mm -hmm. And then I'm I'm standing at the mic because I'm ready. And then I'm ready, so I'm standing at the mic and there is silence for like 30 seconds, and then a minute, and then two minutes, and I am starting to get freaked out. I'm like, I am getting super fired today. And this was fun, glad I got to work on Fire Emblem a little bit. Um, so I leaned into the mic to be like, hey guys, is everything okay? And then out of nowhere, at the loudest possible volume, the engineer plays Raphael's line that goes, hey Ignatz! <laughs> and I scream. <laughs> Wow, <laughs> method. <laughs> That's honestly terrifying because also you like just I want you to imagine you know when when like the room when you're trying to go to sleep is too quiet, <laughs> like these padded rooms. They're so quiet. Are silent, and you're just sitting in there by yourself, knowing that they can hear every burp. <laughs> every hiccup, every stomach grumble, and you're just waiting for someone to show up in your ear and be like, all right, we're gonna go ahead and go for uh, 244 uh, on the Excel spreadsheet that's like in front of you. You're like, cool, 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 who's she uh, talking to? And you're like, uh, we're gonna figure that out. And then you wait for another <laughs> 20 seconds in silence. So it's a lot of silent time. There's a lot of silence. There's a lot of silent time. So I can imagine <laughs> just being like, um, so what are we, what? And then just in your ear. <laughs> Jeez. It was yeah. fantastic. Anyway. Um, it made me, it, it's, I mean, that's, that's how you get it, method acting. It's real. Me and Daniel Day-Lewis, I think we're both up for something next year at the Oscars. We'll Love find that. out. Yeah. Yep. Um, they absolutely did use that take, yes. <laughs> <laughs> the question was, was if they used it, and they did. Um, because it was fun. <laughs> I'm sorry, one more time. <laughs> yes, no, now you will all know the next time you play Fire Emblem Three Houses that that wasn't an Ignat scream, that was a Christian scream. <laughs> <laughs> Just me being scared all the time. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I think if you guys have any questions, there is a lovely mic there. If you want to line up, we can get to that. In the meantime, while you are lining up, I'm going to check and see if there are any other stories that I wrote down that I'm like, you should tell this story because oh it's fun. Oh my gosh, you wrote down stories. So I did. equipped. Um, uh, stories from the booth. I have a Patrick hug, which also was on Ignaz because I was crying and sad when we did the S support. That one was beautiful. Also, um, I would love to do one group picture, and I feel like yeah. we should do it before everyone leaves. Oh yeah, that's a good do idea. Do y'all wanna? Do y'all wanna get this in before we get? Yeah. Woo! Okay, <laughs> Is there any way to have the lights go down a little or no? 
He's like, no. <laughs> this is though. like, we did not prep for this. This is. Get in here. We're gonna do it. Do y'all? Yes. Be dramatic. I want arms. <laughs> All right, let's go. It's acting. <laughs> Don't die. Don't die. I'll tag each and every one of you. <laughs> one of you for sure blinked, though, so we don't know what we can do about that. Um, yes, let's, let's talk about whatever you want. Come on up, ask Violet a question. Well, let's... Uh, welcome. Hi. Uh, go Hello. ahead and state your name and your question. Hello. My name is uh, Frank. Uh, my question is a little kind of a strange one, I guess. Is anime kind of the, like first stepping stone of getting into the voice acting industry. What a great question. The only reason I ask that is because of kind of like the sensitive topic that's going on that a lot of people are leaving that industry because the pay is so marginal compared to video games or, you know, movies. Mm. So my question is, I guess, is anime really a better stepping stone to get your foot in and then move on? Or is it still feasible to stay in that industry because <laughs> you love it or for whatever other reason? I think that that is a very good that is a very good question because uh, there has been some rumbling back and forth about pay and 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 who gets what and union and non-union stuff like that, which is not only super boring to go into, uh, but also uh, we're gonna we're all gonna keep our opinions on that very personal. Um, but uh, is anime a good first stepping stone? With so many people that I have worked with a lot. Yes, my experience has been that they, they started with anime, they took a class at one of, the, one of the anime studios, and they slowly got worked into stuff, and they did incidentals, and then they got a role, and then they got a bigger role, and a bigger role, and that's kind of how a lot of them learn. And I think that, yes, it is a good stepping stone, but it is by no means the only stepping stone or the only way into, into this industry. I think while the pay in anime is not the highest pay in the industry by any stretch of the imagination, there are so many people in there who do it because they really, really do love it. I was just about to say, if you are passionate about anime and you love it, you know, some people are going to do these projects as well because they love it and they want to be part of it. And also the fan communities are amazing and there's more than just the individual sessions. Um, and I also know a lot of people that like will do anime and then they do other jobs that are, might be may, way higher paying or whatever else, but they continue to do anime because they love it. And so I wouldn't necessarily even say like, it's a stepping stone. There are some people that make their whole life and career and livelihood on anime as Absolutely. well. So I think it's, again, super individual to the person. It is one, you know, one version of a path, um, but there are so many paths. Perfect. Thank you, guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. thank you. Great question. <laughs> Woo. Wow, so much support. Oh, we're going back and forth. Noted. Hi. Hi, my name is Alberto. Um, I just wanted to ask, um, is there any improvisation when it comes to voice acting? Is it varied by the script, by the director? Depends on the project. Yeah, it definitely depends on the uh, project. Massively. <laughs> I think sometimes it's very much stick to the script because uh, some of these games are being dubbed from Japanese and you have to um, fit into a very specific time period or if there's already, you know, uh, uh, lip movements or anything like that, you know, you'll be very stuck. And sometimes you have to like add words to make it fit the amount of length that's happening because the Japanese was way longer or shorter or something like that. Um, but like for performance capture, when we're doing kind of the original and all the face capture and that sort of stuff, there's definitely a little more leniency. Luckily, most of the characters are pretty darn on the page and game studios love what they've written because they're really invested in it. Um, but sometimes there's a little leeway. I know in Resident Evil 3, we totally had some improv moments. All have to get it approved. You know, it's a thing. It's like, hey, I want to add this. Cinematic director goes, love that. Let me ask so-and-so. So-and-so goes, let me ask so-and-so. And that person goes, yeah, let's give it a try. <laughs> and then sometimes it stays. <laughs> Even when I was when I was working at Atlas as a writer, there were like pixel limits of how many letters we could have on a line, and they were like they made us. We, we would have to go through with each individual build and do an entire row of capital M's because that was the largest in that font to see exactly how many we could fit in. And then if anything changed or got swapped in the studio, we would have to adjust for that. It becomes kind of a big a, a big deal sometimes, even though it doesn't seem like it's a big deal or a big change. Um, occasionally, we do get the freedom to like to do some stuff. I know occasionally with uh, especially when it comes to like smaller reacts or like battley things or stuff like that. Totally. It's like, oh man, this character is the cat girl character. Give me a nya. And then they will. And then I'll be like, uh, and they'll be like, yeah, sure. We'll take it. God, <laughs> don't use it. Um, 
but yeah, uh, we get to improvise rarely, but when we do, it's fun. Uh, yeah, I've definitely gotten to do a little more improv on, on some of the games where you're not dubbing from another language, mm. because again, you just have more freedom there because you're laying down the OG track. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Quinn. Um, location question. Yeah. Um, do you find that it still matters as much what city an actor is in, or has COVID kind of changed the industry enough that that's not as important? That's uh, it, it kind of, yes and no, which I is super like good answer. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, tradition, technically, very much no. And honestly, there are people that that we've known from the industry who now have like straight up moved they've to Hawaii. They've, they've all, yeah, they've like moved away. Um, I, I think it's one of those where there's so much more opportunity now where yeah. you can. Uh, kind of work from anywhere um, and even be flown out if it's in-person stuff. Um, I have plenty of coworkers that I've worked with on mocap stages that are coming from London or coming from Atlanta or, you know, flying in. The, the upside, I think, to spending some time in one of the main cities, again, is just building a network of people yeah. so that you are close to these people. But you can do that in almost any town, but you still just want to find your people because if you're not, you know, represented or something like that, it's going to be a little bit tougher to get those reads unless you're like self-submitting like crazy and all of that sort of stuff. So yes and no. Yeah, yes and no. Also, it is, I, I will say from, from the director's side, from the acting side, from everything, for me, it is so much easier when we're all in the studio. Oh it my is. God. Oh my God. Uh, I can't tell you the number of sessions that have been like, oh, okay, cool, somebody's internet is down. I guess we're done for the day. That's fantastic. We'll record 13 Sentinels tomorrow. Um, yes. <laughs> it, uh, it's a fun challenge. But yes, it, it can be done from anywhere, but LA, Texas, New York are still kind of like the cores. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thank Quinn. Hey. Y'all don't like have to applause. Like, I mean, it's, it's nice. <laughs> but, like, <laughs> How's it going? Michael hey. from New York. Hey, Michael. Um, so mine's kind of like a brief two-parter because he kind of stole my question. Oh, okay. but, um, so are there like, I know everyone's path is kind of different in this industry. So are there any like telltale signs where you know you're supposed to say, okay, I should probably have a demo by now or okay, I should probably be talking to an agent by now. And like when you get to those points, are you still auditioning for like that toothpaste commercial? Or is that like, if you know you wanna be in like video games and anime and, and even audiobooks and stuff like that, are you even bothering to apply to like things like that? Like those, you know, smaller, e even, you know, like businessy type things. Mm. Um, honestly, uh, again, everybody does have their own unique journey. I straight up don't have a demo because I came into it from a weird backwards angle. I'm getting one done this year, finally, Yay. which means I can like reach out to new different studios and agents and that stuff. There are no like go-to signs of like, hey, this means I'm, I'm, I'm at this point and I can finally progress to the next level. But generally, I think there's, there's, there's not a lot of go-to signs that you are ready to do that, but there are definitely signs that you are not ready to do that, mostly because those things cost a lot of money. Like demos on average are between $1,500 and $3,000 for like a well-produced real demo. Yep. And that's great. But if you do that when you've taken one class and like kind of done community theater once, you are setting yourself up to fail. And you don't want to do that. Sometimes all you get is a first impression on this stuff. Surrounding yourself with people that you trust to give you yeah. actual feedback is also important and being willing to take it and go, oh, you're right. Now, don't, don't surround yourself with naysayers either. You want yeah. people that believe in you, but also will tell you the truth and be honest. And I would say like demos, um, I, I do have a demo, but it's been a while since I've kind of like redone it. In general, demos are used mostly to get an agent, I feel like yeah. at this point, because then once you have an agent, it's all audition based and I feel like casting's not listening to demos as much as they're listening to your auditions or yeah. your reads. Um, that being said, like the question about commercials specifically is a lot of agencies will ask for commercial demos and also require or request sort of the commercial work because they almost like, they don't gatekeep animation and video games, but commercials are incredibly profitable for them yeah. as well. Right. So most of the time, even if like I do really exclusively video games and animation, <laughs> but I still get uh, commercial voiceover auditions and I still lay them down every time um, yeah. because it's just part of the package and I'd love to do a commercial, sure, you know? <laughs> um, so it's, it's kind of a package deal. You'll definitely still end up doing both um, as you get going. 
I think like we were actually talking about earlier, we're incredibly fortunate that we like do this job and can pay our rent and stuff like that and like live an, a, a life to any degree, which for me basically means like there is nothing that I won't audition for. Obviously there are, there are understandable lines for that sort of stuff, but like if I mostly do video games but a commercial comes down, I'm gonna read for it. If an audiobook wants to hear what I sound like, I'm giving them my stuff. Anything, like the jobs are what keep you going and you never know who is gonna hear that job and then be like, I like that person and I want them for something else. Absolutely, cool. yeah. Thank Thank you so much, guys. Thank Appreciate you. <laughs> We're applauding now. <laughs> Hi, I'm Ryan. Um, you kind of touched on it earlier, but I know that a lot of opportunities come through connections you have and networking, for lack of a better word. What are some of the best ways and places you've seen to meet these people and make these connections, if that makes sense? I think primarily it's, and again, it's kind of a weird thing. This actually ties in a little bit with how I got into Atlas. Um, when I first went to apply there, I applied as a tester and I took the test and they had me write out a bunch of bugs and stuff. And at the end they were like, cool, you're good at this. You can find the bugs. They weren't hard in this particular ROM, but you don't have any experience, so we can't hire you. Um, and then I annoyed them for six months until they hired me. Um, nicely, I annoyed them nicely. I feel like I feel bad every time I say that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's just like, yes, don't say that anymore. Um, <laughs> But it is kind of a weird catch-22, that even if you have this skill, it's tough because people, you're, you're not a known commodity or a trusted commodity yet. I think the best way really to get in there is classes, classes with any kind of studio that will do it. I know Bang Zoom, which is sort of one of the big anime studios mommy. in LA. Yeah, uh, Mami Okada and everyone out there, like they offer these classes with, which are with tremendous directors like Tony Oliver and Julie Maddalena who have done so much anime and have worked on it. And not only can they teach you how to do it and how to like really learn the art of dubbing because as well as like acting as a skill, dubbing is its own crazy skill. It is. Um, but while it's, it's not like, hey, we're a feeder group and we're finding people, if you're good and you stand up and you go to a couple classes and then you go somewhere else and they hear about someone, that's where you get your opportunities from. I know it seems like a big sort of like, roll the dice and figure it out, um, but. And the other thing I, I always add on to that is like, just, just continue to have an energy of passion and yeah. peace. Like live a full life. Sometimes actors or people that wanna be actors get really like, oh, I wanna do this and like, have the passion, tell people what you wanna do, tell people what you're excited about. And also like have other things in your life, be a human, cause that's why I get big on like, build friendships, not just connections. Mm -hmm. Because at some level, just the, the, the feeling of commodity of like, oh, we're all just, you know, it's like, ah, money and all of that, like build relationships, like have good friends, you know, and, and, and have other things to offer about who you are because also your work will be so much better if you're living a full life and you have something to say. I don't know. Okay, Knitting. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, hi, I'm Jacob. Hi, Jacob. Um, nice to meet you guys. Uh, real quick, um, my, my question is kind of a downer, I guess. Uh, has there ever been like a moment where you've had like a reality check in the industry about like either somebody like that you've looked up to or <laughs> and, and, or, or a, a thing that you thought was going to be amazing turned out to be basically hell? Um, and how did you move on from that? Um, you want to go first? <laughs> oh, sorry, what? I said, you want to go first? Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> everything is terrible. No. Um, <laughs> I, uh, there are reality checks once a month. All um, the time. One, all the time, especially because you're submitting for tons of stuff and you're not getting all of it. I think my, my favorite quote on this was Ray Chase was like, I keep an audition, and Ray Chase is Noctis and like, he's everybody. Ray's I amazing. keep a folder of all of my auditions, and I had 5,000 auditions last year, and I booked maybe 50 to 100 roles, and that is a real good ratio. 50 to 100 roles is insane. Yeah, That's it's incredible. That's insane. Um, um, yeah, no, I actually do the same thing. You have to recognize that like, mostly this industry is Sure, rejection, but honestly, it's also just like feeling like you're shouting into a void and not hearing back on hundreds of auditions. So that's just kind of how it goes. So you get a reality check literally all the time. Yeah. And then every once in a while, you get an email being like, hey, uh, so-and-so actually wants to see if uh, they're available for this day. And you're like, they know who I am? <laughs> I feel like I've sent in 700 auditions for them. And this is the first time I've ever, oh, yeah, they've been in a folder. We got a role for you. You're like, what? I, um, I had one, one really harsh one that got me was there was a role that came through auditions that I was perfect for because I play the nice good boys and hopefully everybody else. Um, but 
like it was great. I was requested specifically. They were like, we want to hear Christian read on this because we know he plays the nice good boys and he's good at this. And I felt super confident. I know my audition was good. I sent it in feeling good. Anybody who like heard it or listened to it was like, yeah, that's great. I think you've got a real shot at this. And I did not get it. And it was such a killer for me emotionally because even if it's not a huge game, it still sucks because I put so much work into this thing and I felt good and you not you don't always feel good about your auditions. Sometimes you're just like, hope it works. No. Yeah. Um, and then as far as moving on, like I'm big on like you really, it's, it's something you invest so much of yourself into. You're, you're literally, it's like, it's me. I'm selling me. Yeah. Hi. It's me. It's my voice, my face. It's whatever. And my bat, you know, like it's me. So it's incredibly personal, and then as soon as you're done, you just can't take any of it personally, because yeah. it's not about you. you. Gotta leave it in the booth. So it's very much one of those things, like you walk away by having a full life, have other things that you're excited about, care about, friends, hobbies, whatever else, because you're passionate and it means so much. And at the end of the day, like you can't control it. It's still, it's still like literally a miracle, you know, <laughs> like when you get the email. Uh, and celebrate, celebrate every little success, even if it's just, I'm so proud of that audition. I did really good today. And I think that's super important because it just helps keep you elevated for all of the, the no's and the voids and the, and the didn't, sorry, not right for the roles that yeah. you get being like, I was perfect. <laughs> Thanks a lot, guys. Thanks. Thank you. Also, I'm jealous you met Travis and Laura. What was that? I said I'm jealous you met Travis and Laura. So. Oh, yes. Uh, no, yeah, they're amazing. Uh, hi, I'm Kyle. Yo, Kyle. Um, so I wanted to ask uh, if there's like a role, like let's say, like you feel like you're born for, um, you know, like Eric Bauza or, or Jeff Bergman or Brett Iwin, you know, so like you hear a voice growing up and you're like, this is me, like, like I know this is me and you grow up and you realize that like it evolves with you and you become more of that voice. Um, do you have any advice for like kind of trying to take that uh, professionally, like, like going out and trying to see if that can be your like career in life? That is so specific. I love <laughs> that you have specificity in your goals. I, I will say it evolved. <laughs> the, the question evolved as I went down yeah, the line. Yeah, <laughs> I was going to say, I, again, really individual paths. I would not necessarily um, look down upon someone who's like, this is the thing that I want, because I feel like not everyone has that. Not everyone like really knows, like, this is the thing that I want. But with that level of like precision and down, you're also going to have to probably expand your horizons a little bit and broaden back out and go, okay, cool, if this is the thing that I want, you know, here's all of the other things I'm going to get good at and I'm going to do so that when that opportunity does come my way or I make that opportunity happen for myself, I'm ready for it. You hear celebrities talk all the time of like, I've wanted to make this film for 20 years. <laughs> and it took them 20 years to be able to make that film, you know? But then at the end of the day, like, that's one film. So be open to being surprised. It's one of my life mottos. Like, just be open to being surprised. And the real talk is that, like, very fortunately, there's no shortage of work and there's no shortage of opportunities. And even if you miss that one opportunity that you thought for sure was going to be the thing that you had dedicated your life for, you don't know when the sequel is going to come out. You don't know when they're the going to look for the next thing. The remake? Exactly. <laughs> it comes literally. Sometimes you could be a Jill Sandwich and not even know it. Like, <laughs> I did not know. I definitely didn't go into it being like, oh, yes, my goal is to be Jill Valentine. And then you're like, what? I get to be Jill Valentine? It's a thing. Especially because, and this is my other, my one other sidebar thing that I like to say a lot, is a lot of people have this, like, I want to be Yuri Lowenthal. And that's great, because Yuri Lowenthal is the freaking best. But we have Yuri Lowenthal. We need you. We yep. need someone else. So, yeah. And also, you're always going to be you. Like, that's at some level, again, like, we're auditioning, like, it's me. It's literally me. It's me. So, you know, like, that, that's what you have to offer. And that's, what, again, I keep going back to, like, Live a full life, have something to offer, like have something that you're proud of. You're like, hey, I'm just proud to be me. Not everyone's gonna want it, but someone will. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ramaji, and this question might be very short because it might just be a no, but I wanted to know about the process of potentially doing motion capture for, for Guilty Gear Strive, because I know that there's people do very <laughs> unhuman things. And I wanted to know if they tried to force 
figure out how to put motion capture in it, or they just were like, nah, I we're doing a voice only role. Don't know the full answer to this, but I don't believe there's any motion capture for Guilty Gear that <laughs> I know about. I did no I did no motion capture for Jacko. I didn't do the back bend. <laughs> yes, I've tried it at home in the privacy of my own room. Yes, I got I pretty close. Have. No, you can't see it. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, next person. Hi, I'm Molly. Um, so hi, Molly. Hi. So this question kind of focuses more on like potentially artistic challenges, more more so in Christian's case. But uh, and <laughs> yeah, <they're good. laughs> um, but just just for Christian, uh, for for Christian with like Ignatz himself, obviously with between cell of two different versions in Fire Emblem, and then the five year time skip with Ignatz, there's a bit of a a bit of a time gap there. And then for, for Casey playing Jill, she's such an iconic character, and Resident Evil is such a big thing. Uh, was there any kind of pressure, like, oh, what is everybody gonna think? I'm voicing such an iconic character. Uh, what were like some of the some of the ways you kind of tackled those challenges? Yeah, uh, there is definitely a sense of legacy, especially once Fire Emblem Heroes started, and I was like, oh my god, it's Fire Emblem characters that have never had a voice before, oh god. <laughs> um, with those sorts of things, at the end of the day, all you can do is what you've got. All you can do is, is, is send out your best and hope for the best in return. And once you get the role, then you can dive into like my motivations and why I'm here and doing this sort of stuff. I think it's a lot of those times the main asset that I have had in the booth is a really good director yep. who knows what's up and knows not only how to tell me to get to the thing that I want or knows when to scream that, hey, Ignatz into the microphone, but like has the, has the full understanding of something that maybe even the client hasn't seen. You know, like within five seconds, Patrick picked up on who Ignatz was, why he was like that, and moreover, why five years down the line, his like victory lines changed from like, I did it, I did, to like, no mercy. <laughs> because <laughs> that's Some heavy. Boy who will kill you with an arrow. <laughs> he will, he will kill you with an arrow. He will kill you with anything. Um, <laughs> But even just, just coming into it with this little like, cool, so now we have this five year time skip. I'm trying to remember exactly what he said, but I don't have the words in it. But he was like, here's the brief idea of what changes and why you change and why you're different. And honestly, all it takes is like a good director to know the sentence to be like, this is why you're different now, go. Mm -hmm. I was gonna, I mean, I'm gonna say the same thing in that like, um, Yes, I knew it was an iconic role, but I really just trusted the team around me and I relied on them because I knew everyone there either was a fan at some point or knows what's going on and they put her on the page and they put they wouldn't have hired me if if I, what I was doing wasn't what their vision was for this iteration of her. So I was really just open to being like, look, this is this is my version, and I'd love to pay respect to the Jills that came before, but also I'm gonna do what fits into this gritty tone, this kind of action-packed version. This everything that we were doing was still very much in the story. So as well as long as I'm like staying focused on my scene partner, and I'm freaking working across Jeff Shine with Steve Knievely directing like these are amazing talented people so you end up just being really focused on what you're doing and you kind of let everything else fade away because that's not my job at that point like it's not my job to think about how people are going to receive it my job is to just be here and be present and run away from a freaking 10 foot tall monster how tall is he i don't know too tall, tall. very tall too tall scary <laughs> thank you thank you uh hi my name is lance hi lance Hello. Um, so I actually have a question that's very similar to the last one. Sure. Um, how do you exactly reprise a role? And <laughs> I ask that because like a character like Salif, who has never had a voice before, could potentially get a remake. God, so, I so I assume you would, you know, Please. Yeah. <laughs> I assume you would go back for that role in the future if they call you back for it. And a character like Jill, who has a long legacy yeah. um, behind her had multiple roles, uh, people play her roles. So like, you know, to put it shortly, how do you become a Charles Martinet for your, mm. for a character where you're never gonna change? I think, well, luckily we are in a situation now where when, when things like that are happening, when they are casting uh, roles and stuff like that, everyone now 
now video games are so prolific and are such an art form that everyone has an awareness that like, hey, we could do this now, and we in 10 years, they could come back and be another thing. Mm -hmm. Like, we, they could pop back up in a thing, they could be in this side story, they could be there, they could be vaguely referenced. Um, so a lot of times, I know that people do cast with that sort of thing in mind, but really, at the end of the day, when they're casting in the first place, they're casting because this person is right for the role. They have done the right things, they perform the correct way, they have the right emotions to play that role, and there's no reason to assume that in five years and 10 years when the next game comes out that features them, that they won't still have that ability. In fact, it'll probably be way easier to be like, great, you remember Selif? And I'll be like, heck yeah. And they'll be like, awesome, we're doing 9,000 lines. Um, <laughs> Here it is. <laughs> just every actor's dream. And I think mostly on breakdowns, like they're gonna reference if they're like, we're looking for a sound alike, or no, we're looking for a new iteration of this role, show us what you got, yeah. you know? And that's a lot of creativity. And then as far as like, it takes years and you could come back like several years later, my favorite thing is like, hi, do you have a sound reference for what I did? Cool, <laughs> thank you so much. Um, and you have them play it back to you if you need to match yourself. Yeah. Too. Just to be like, what, what was the, yep, okay, got it. Mm -hmm. My favorite ones are, I thought I was dead. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> People are going to have opinions about this. He's coming back. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Hi, my name is Venna. I am the one that corrected you on your tweet because I got freaked out. Um, <laughs> Thank you, I, I, I'm silly. <laughs> We're on the East Coast. I don't know, because previously people have gotten on my case for like, what time zone, Christian? And I'm like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Pacific, <laughs> where I live. <laughs> Wherever I am. I have five billion things to ask, but I'll focus on one. <laughs> um, so, uh, long story short, I have an accent, and I've always had troubles with my voice uh, that I just recently got surgery for, fairly, and my, I've always been told my entire life that I will never have a career in anything voiceover, voice acting, any of that sort, uh, simply be unless I got rid of my accent. But I've also noticed uh, a shift in voice acting and voice uh, and characters having accents, having more diversity. Do you have like anything? Do you have anything to say about that, or like any opinions? Just because it's really inspiring, and I would love to hear what you guys, um, what you guys think. Sure. I think really at this point, what's wonderful is that anything can work. Yep. And I mean, obviously there are hard lines for it. There are a lot of, I probably would not get Jill Valentine for obvious reasons. Oh. I put in my best audition and whatever. Sorry, Capcom Christian. made the decision they made. Look, uh. I thought you were great at the callbacks, but. Yeah. Um, but the reality is that like, Yes, there's, there are always possibilities. There are thing that, things that could come out of nowhere. There are people who work a lot who have like very particular speech patterns and things that like are noticeable but now become a part of that character and now yeah. are like it's part like of a who they are. It's like specificity, you yeah. know, in some ways like, oh, this is an asset that I have. It is a really specific thing that only I sound like or I do and sometimes there's, there's a space for that. So I think absolutely, you know, keeping hope and, and yeah. continuing to practice too if you enjoy other accents or playing with accents. Like there's lots of more accented roles. So it's really fun to kind of like see new takes on characters um, and people that bring something really unique can be incredibly special and become fan favorites like people love that you know so is it always good to be able to turn stuff on and off or twist stuff or change stuff yes absolutely that's being a chameleon is half the work of voice acting but there is there are always places and voice acting is very open and very diverse and that is really really good I'm, I'm very proud of that okay. because I had something to do with it sorry I didn't <laughs> all right that's my question for now thank, thank you. you so much Hi there, my name is Zach. What up? And uh, I just want to ask, as somebody who's never had a portfolio in voice acting, but has always had an interest in it, growing up with somebody like David Hayter, for example, though that's not my range. Um, He's the greatest, we love him. <laughs> I miss him dearly. Anyway. He's, I, he's still alive. Oh no, he's alive, he's just not <laughs> Snake anymore. <laughs> but, what is a method to practice for yourself when you don't have that experience going into it? 
I've had small roles that have done very little, gone nowhere, and as you've mentioned, you throw in a thousand and you don't even get one. Sometimes you'll throw in one, you get it back the next day. Mm -hmm. yep. But I only ever practice at home, alone, in D&D sessions as the DM, or as a character, or in the shower on my own. Yeah, me too. Uh, I, think, I think everybody does at some <laughs> point. It's for fun, but what is a method to practice if you don't have a crowd to help you? Get on a mic. <laughs> yeah, so if you're spending... Like right now? <laughs> yeah, right now you are on a mic. Um, yeah, I think spending time uh, actually listening to yourself back is really good. Also, yeah. get inspired by other media and other people and other voice actors. I think uh, one of the actors' like greatest talents and gifts is to steal from everyone else they think is great. Um, so yeah, steal stuff you think is cool and twist it into your own and work on it. And then, yeah, I mean, if you, if you have the ability to get into classes, that's amazing because you yep. can get direct feedback. And then legitimately, we live in an era of social media. Make stuff, people will respond to it. You can get all sorts of opinions, sometimes very bad, sometimes very good, um, because we have such a crazy uh, media now. So there's so many opportunities um, to sort of create and get feedback and, and learn and grow and stretch. I think trying to find mentors and people that inspire you is, uh, really valuable, and it's something that I did for sure. Definitely, and there are there are ways you. Sometimes it takes a little extra hunting. You know, there are Discord groups that are de that get together for weekly voiceover workouts just to try stuff, and that's the community of people that are like, just give it your shot. Like you never thought you'd be snake. Go ahead, give us give us a snake just to see and have other people like talk about what they liked and what they didn't like about it. There's always there's always something to learn from from other people and other perspectives on it. And at the end of the day, that's what you have to do. Um, unfortunately, I did get the, the time sign, so I think I don't think we have time for any more questions. I apologize sincerely to those of you who waited Raining. very patiently in line. Um, I will probably hang out for a little bit and do my best to answer some questions outside if I can. Um, but thank you, everybody, thank for you coming. Thank you all so much. We really appreciate having you here. Woo!